So I'm here uh, doing a five minute lightning talk on the Xmonad tiling window manager. So um, audience participation, who here uses Xmonad? Yeah. Awesome, okay, so some, <laughs> some of you do. Um, everyone who just raised their hands, you probably know more about this than I do. Um, I've literally been using this for, I think it's been 10 days. So this is very much from a newbie standpoint and let me tell you, I am in love. So. Um, You've probably used traditional window managers. Uh, most people with computers have used these. Um, traditional window managers kind of look like this. You have uh, windows which overlap each other. There's a lot of like dragging things around and manually resizing things. And manually resizing things isn't very much fun. Um, I don't like touching the mouse. Um, there's lots of wasted space. Anytime you have something where you can see your background, you could have put a window there. So there's lots of wasted space. Um, you have obscured windows where it's like, oh, I want to see what's behind that, but there's another window on top. It's designed to sort of mimic my desk, which is covered in papers and I can't find anything. So they're not, they're not fantastic as far as I'm concerned. Tiling window managers, on the other hand, are designed such that every piece of space is used. So this here is uh, what it looked like when I was writing my talk. And as you can see, every piece of space there is used, everything is nicely tiled, nothing is obscuring anything else. Nice thing about uh, tiling managers, of which there are many, you have automatic resizing. So instead of having to grab the mouse and make things smaller and bigger, your window manager does that for you. You don't have to drag things around because your window manager does that for you. You don't have to worry about overlaps because the window manager handles not doing that for you. And the very, very best thing for me is you get to feel totally smug. <laughs> because when people look at your desktop, they're like, oh, what are you running? And it's like, I'm running X mode at, and it's written in Haskell. And I feel completely smug at that point. The only downside is that GIMP doesn't work all that well. And that's a, a familiar story to most people who have used tiling window managers. So I want to uh, mention Xmonad, which is what I'm using. Um, it's written in Haskell. It's highly configurable. It's kind of amazing because the window manager itself is like only a few thousand lines of code. So if you wanted to, you can actually fit the entire thing into your head and understand how it works. Um, but what I want to do is show off a live demo um, of what this looks like. So what you can actually, what I'm seeing on my screen, um, if I switch over to it uh, here, there we go. This is what I've actually been seeing on my screen. Um, on the left hand side there, I've got my uh, speaker's notes. On the right hand side, I've got some terminals. You can see me futzing around with uh, uh, me getting the, the screen running. And using keyboard commands, I can actually uh, resize these windows. So this is uh, uh, super H and super L. Uh, you can see that I'm making that left-hand screen larger and smaller. Um, I can cycle through my windows using uh, uh, J and K, Super J and K, which is, again is VI bindings, which I love. And I can actually bring a, uh, a window to the main pane on the left-hand side by using uh, Super Enter. Super on my key is the caps lock key because I don't use it for anything else. But I can also do nifty things. I can uh, move through different formats. So super space lets me change through like full screen mode. Um, I think that is a, a tiling mode. Maybe, yeah, that's a tiling mode. So you don't have a main screen, everything is tiled. The, there's this mode, which I had before, where we've got a main screen on the left. And this one here, I've got a main panel on the top. And again, I can make that main panel bigger and smaller. So it's really, really quite cool, as far as I'm concerned, being able to automatically you know, open up new windows, uh, tile things around, so on and so forth. The other thing which I want to show you is uh, if I make this a full screen here, oops, that's not what I wanted. Uh, let me just, where's, where is my screen? <laughs> okay, so I, I want to show you some, Sometimes not everything works quite as it's supposed to. Um, so live demos are amazing. Oh, I need to be over here. There we go. What, what, where's the rest of my stuff? Okay, so let me just, do, 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 let's pop over to here. Okay, so let's pretend that I wanna show you, I don't know how much time I've got left here. Um, this is what, <laughs> I know where this is. No, I don't. Let's just, okay, cool. If I'm in my Xmonad directory, and there we go, that's what I wanted. I wanted to make things bigger. And I vim my file, you can see here, yeah, edit it anyway. <laughs> you can see here that like, you know, everything is Haskell. And uh, this is my configuration file. Um, I've actually, I'll tell you how I inherited this. 
Um, so you know, there's a bunch of information here. There's a bunch of comments on how things work. I have like this grid layout. I have different workspaces for different things. So I've got Firefox and Facebook and games and music and so on and so forth. Um, and then I can actually set up uh, on different desktops. I'm going to have uh, different layouts which get used. And if I scroll down here, uh, I can set up uh, key bindings all by myself to do various things. Um, and down here, I've actually got, this is my favorite part, when I open up various applications, send them to particular desktops automatically. Um, so if I open up Steam, for example, it goes to the games uh, desktop. And if I open up uh, Chromium, which is what I use for Facebook, it goes there. And if I open up Banshee, it's supposed to go to music. Um, but as you can see there, I've got a comment saying that it, it doesn't quite work. Um, so that... Lowercase b will get it working. Awesome. Um, I'm, about, I'm just about to get to that part of my talk. Um, so if I head back to here, no. Um, if I head back to here, here we go. So xmonad.hs is this main file which you can edit. Um, and one of the neat things about this is that if you edit that file, rather than having to shut down your entire window manager and like start it back up again, you can just hit super Q and it will recompile your entire Xmonad system and reload it whilst everything is running, which is the coolest thing ever. You can make little incremental changes and see if they work, and if they don't, you can undo them and hopefully get back to where you were before. Um, I don't recommend if you're gonna use X, uh, Xmonad that you start with absolutely nothing. I actually suggest that you find some starting configs which kind of set things up the way you want. Um, I actually found starting configs by David Brewer uh, that were up on GitHub. So github.com, David Brewer, xmonad at Ubuntu conf. And if you want to find mine, which I have modified from there, which means you can then send me pull requests to get Banshee working, you can find them at that location. So github.com slash pgf xmonad at Ubuntu conf. And that is hopefully in both cases should be easy to set up. There's actually a, uh, a, it's a shell script you can install, a run that installs all the dependencies and sets everything up and so on and so forth. Um, so thank you very, very much. Uh, if you're using Xmonad, I hope you're going to do wonderful things. And I don't know if we have time for questions, but if we do, I'm happy to hear them. No, we don't. Awesome. Thank you very much. Uh, now we have Sebastian Holzapfel. All right. All right. Are we sweet? Awesome. All right, am I audible? Yes, fantastic. All right, uh, hello, my name's Sebastian. Some of you may remember me from my talk yesterday where I accidentally let slip that I smuggled uranium through airport security. Um, <laughs> yeah. So basically, is anyone here a user of Powerline Shell? Or has heard of Powerline Shell or anything like that? Yeah, a couple of people. Um, I might give a bit of a demonstration for those that haven't. This is actually related to Haskell, by the way. Um, give me one second. So Powerline Shell is basically a, a, a prompt, a custom prompt for Bash. And you can do um, some nice things with it. Like you can probably see now that looks a bit different to your normal shell. It's got these nice arrows. Um, it actually uh, segments up your directories, that sort of thing. If I run a command that's wrong, it'll give me an error code, for example. If I run a program and then put it into the background, it'll tell me how many programs are in the background on my shell, that sort of stuff. Um, so that's basically, that, that's a simple explanation of what Powerline is. Um, and if you've used Powerline before, you might have been disappointed in the performance of Powerline because it's actually built on Python and the startup time of that, I found, it means that you've got a couple of milliseconds, well, probably a couple of hundred milliseconds of latency between when you execute a command and when you get a nice prompt. So what I've done is created a Haskell clone of Powerline, basically, um, that is a whole lot faster, and you can customize it yourself. You can add plugins and things. Um, it, uh, as you can see from here, 
You basically just declare what you want each segment to do. You can just use normal Haskell syntax for that. You can declare the colors and things. So for example, if I want to, if I really like bananas for some reason, I could change my bash prompt to be bananas and then, uh, eh. actually, I think that won't, that won't be visible, will it? If I could just go, Dull. Uh, back. That should work. It's grey. It's really strange. So the terminal codes for Haskell, I don't know. But there you go. So now I have a, an awesome banana terminal. Um, <laughs> I don't know why you would want that. Um, but yeah, I'm actually I'm all I'm working on a Git plugin as well, which is the normal power line has that. But if you're interested, uh, it is on Bitbucket. It's not on Git. For some reason, I like Bitbucket. You can hate on me if you would like. Um, there's some documentation on how to actually install it. Um, all the source code is there. The link is here if you are interested. Um, and thanks for paying attention. That's it for me. Anyone have any questions or we don't have time? No. OK. Yeah, now we have Benno Leslie, and uh, also one, one other thing I forgot to mention, uh, the FP Miniconf hashtag was trending today, so good on you all. Woo! <laughs> okay, so uh, earlier today we had uh, Jed give a really good talk about uh, thinking about append-only computing and how that kind of stuff might work, and we saw some examples in, in Haskell there. What um, I want to do is give you a bit of an example of how you could do this in Postgres rather th uh, than some custom data store. So what we're going to be uh, looking at, we've got a table of things. Um, they just have an ID, but we could add in any other immutable properties that we might want uh, in that table. And then we've got a another table which is our things status log and this is where we're going to store the mutable bit of uh, our things so in this case we're just putting in a status but we could add all the other properties that you might want for your thing that you want to be able to change over time so this isn't how you normally write something in SQL but this is how we can kind of abuse SQL if you want to get the goodness of append only. So with this, we'd go and create some things and we'd end up with one of our, our thing table with, with those records in it. And then we could go and do some updates to the status of all our things. So we can make one sad, one bad, one mad. Uh, and then we can make one happy at, at the end. Um, you can probably tell that I've got kids and kind of read a lot of Dr. Seuss and stuff. Um, so, so this is what our, our table of status log ends up with, and obviously that could grow forever, which may end up being a problem at some stage, but we can buy disks for us and we can produce data, we hope. <laughs> but at, when you're actually kind of using this for doing queries, what you really want is the, the last status for, for each thing. So we wanna, we wanna be able to do something like that down the bottom, we wanna get the thing ID and the status. And what we're gonna do is create a thing status view that will let us get this out. Up till now, everything has been fairly standard SQL. Probably even if you don't know SQL, it probably made sense more or less. Uh, this won't. <laughs> so, this uses um, uh, recursive uh, with uh, statements to effectively go through and um, get the latest 
row of the status log for each different ID. Trust me, it does. Um, so I'm not going to go through that in detail, but if you're interested in that stuff, you Google recursive with statements and you'll find something that runs through it in, in a bit more detail. Really just want to sort of show you that you kind of can do this. Um, one problem with that is that kind of stuff uh, just there by itself doesn't, uh, unless you add some indexes, the performance is going to really suck. So if we put on an index on our log that uh, indexes by the thing ID and the status ID there, we actually, this thing actually turns into something that's pretty fast, even if you've got a lot of statuses. Um, if for some reason you kind of don't want that index because maintaining your index is too hard or um, you don't actually need to get a s update of the exact part of your uh, status at any point in time, Postgres has this nice feature called materialize views. And that's kind of like this interesting combination between a table and a view. So it allocates storage for you and when you materialize the view, it takes your query and actually shoves it into onto disk with some data and then you can access that really quickly. So depending on your use case, you might want to use the live view or a materialized view that you refresh from time to time. So that's all. Hopefully if you're thinking about append only kind of things for your systems and Postgres or another SQL database is already in your compute infrastructure, these kind of tricks might be useful. Thanks.